Well, I have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Science. And that is to say, physics, medicine, nature, or space, time, the brain, life, the universe. Hello, this week we're continuing our month of science at the extremes by looking at extreme cold, including expeditions to the poles, what happens at absolute zero, and the animals that can survive temperatures we never could. Plus... Oh, that is noticeably colder. <laughs> Adam gets up close and personal with some icy science. But before that, in news, the massive death risk from climate change, a prize for mapping the seabed, and a new piece of the puzzle in the story of human migration. I'm Adam Murphy. I'm Chris Smith, and this is The Naked Scientist. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. First up in the news this week, Theresa May raised the issue of climate change with Donald Trump during his recent state visit to the UK. This comes as scientists from the University of Bristol are saying that limiting extreme global warming could prevent thousands of people dying from the effects of high temperatures. They claim that to achieve this, every country needs to ramp up its climate commitments to reach the Paris Agreement's target of limiting the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. By looking at cities in the US, this is the first study to examine the human mortality cost if global warming goes above two degrees. Phil Sansom spoke to the paper's lead author, Eunice Lowe. Hundreds to thousands of heat-related deaths could be avoided if we limit global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. It's a substantial number. Based on the current climate commitments, we are probably heading toward three degree warming. So this is way higher than the one and a half or two degrees within the Paris Agreement. And so our study looked at what would be the public health benefits of increasing our climate action to achieve the Paris Agreement's goal. So what exactly did you do? We have data from the period of 1987 to 2000 of daily temperature and also daily counts of mortality of 15 cities in the United States. Well, all US cities? Yes, all US cities, and they're all rather populated or they're major US cities. Part of the funding for this paper was from the Union of Concerned Scientists in the United States, and also the United States have more reliable health data and weather station data than many other places in the world. So um, that was another reason why we chose to study the United States. Okay, so you had this data from the 15 cities. What did you do with it? We found relationships between temperature and mortality. So we were able to then say, for example, at 25 degrees Celsius in New York City, what is the mortality risk? And so with this relationship, we combined it with future climate projections to estimate future mortality levels. It's as simple as that, huh? You could just find the relationship and then apply it to, you know, (laughs) what what we know about future temperatures. There's a lot more complexity in the modelling side of things. We have created scenarios that describe the one and a half degree, two degree and three degrees world to create the results. We have found that hundreds to thousands of heat related deaths that would occur in the current trajectory of three degree world that could be avoided if we limit global warming to one and a half degrees. So essentially, these many deaths could be prevented if we increase climate action. I guess it seems like a lot in itself, but in a city of maybe millions of people, a Mm. thousand people isn't that many. Do you think that's like the full picture? I still think this is a significant result because obviously we wouldn't want huge increases in heat-related mortality in a warming world. And hundreds to thousands of people per city in a certain year is kind of a lot, in my opinion. Are there any other factors that weren't included that could potentially make things easier or could make things worse? Yeah, yeah. We have based our study on current population and not included any, you know, population growth in the future. And we also haven't included an aging population in our study. People who are 65 years old or above are more susceptible to heat-related mortality than younger people. So um, these factors could increase our estimates in terms of the number of heat-related deaths. But on the other hand, if there were future adaptation measures, for example, if there is better health care 
or there's an improved early warning system for extreme high temperatures or heat waves, then these adaptation measures could also reduce the number of heat-related deaths. And so the takeaway message here is that regional adaptation is also very important and could prevent exacerbation of or large increases in heat-related mortality in the future. Sobering research that and absolutely vital. That was Eunice Lowe speaking to Phil Sansom and you can read that study in the journal Science Advances. Thanks, Adam. Now, it's a fact that we know more about space than we do about the bottom of our own oceans here on Earth. But there are plans to at least put a dent into that deficit. Seabed 2030 is a mission to map the bottom of the sea. And a team based in the UK have recently won one of the Shell Ocean Discovery X Prizes worth a total of $7 million for developing a seabed scanning technology. To explain, Naked Scientist tech correspondent, who's also an angel investor, Peter Cowley, is with us. Peter, welcome. What have they actually claimed to have invented? They, they put together some existing systems in a novel way. So it's a prize that was launched about three or four years ago, and they won it. It's actually 14 nations, but the major part of it, which is the ship itself, was designed here in the UK. So what the prize was for was to be able to map the seabed in a much better way. And so this was a combination of a ship and a, an underwater drone-type device. How does it work? The underwater drone is, looks like a bit like a torpedo. It's self-propelled. It'll do up to four knots. It's got a variety of different sensors on it, including cameras, and other devices. But what's novel about it is that it's also got associated with a ship, which is also autonomous. So the torpedo will come up to the surface, get it onto the ship, which is autonomous as well, charge itself up and then go back down again. So the ship can then act as a base for it. And so the ship then is, I say, is fully autonomous if necessary, could be partially autonomous. What measurements are they going to make and how long is this going to take? The prize itself was asking for devices to map out the surface of the seabed at up to 4,000 metres deep, about 12,000 feet. And the target for this prize was to have 24 hours to map as much as possible. And they managed to map 278 square kilometres in that time. But the idea behind it is to find geological features. And they found more than 10 features which hadn't been known before. In the Mediterranean, this was as well. So in other words, it's, it's going to look at a subset of the ocean floors because we must have mapped quite a bit already, haven't we? It's a only bit a few percent. Really? Yeah, yeah. And so they'll get this map. What are they going to do with it? When they finally do it, there's all kinds of things they can do with it, from commercial applications, for instance, mining. I mean, there's a huge amounts of minerals down there on the seabed. They can do forecasts of tsunamis. There's a whole load of ocean current measurements they could do. So the idea is to have a map of the whole world by 2030, as it says, which can then be analysed, particularly by this organisation, the General Bathymetric Chart of the Oceans, which is the sort of the overarching body here. Of course, the conservationists are quite worried about this undersea exploitation, aren't they? Because there are these wonderful, pristine resources down there in huge abundance, Mm. these mineral things, and and they are relatively accessible to us these days compared with the price now of recovering, for instance, oil in the Mm. same way. But at the same time, if we don't know what is down there in terms of geology, we also don't know what's down there in terms of biology. And we could therefore, in the, in the course of going and recovering those minerals, be doing untold damage yes. to unique species. As you'll see later on in this programme with a, a, an animal I've just seen. Um, yes. <laughs> say no more. No, say no more. No, exactly. P- Peter exactly. is referring to the fact that Lloyd Peck is coming on and he's got in her box, he's got a, a dinner plate sized sea spider. Exactly, yes, <laughs> which I've had a good look at. Yeah. Yeah, of course, that's that, that's the point. In fact, I, I met a guy some years ago which was picking up uh, cobalt nodules uh, off the Hawaiian coast, and he'd actually put a hundred million pounds into do this, and they were hoovering them up from a very good. Route. So, yeah, there's clearly going to be an ecological disadvantage, but there is also an advantage in being able to mm. find these minerals in places which aren't going to damage the normal above surface land. Peter. Thanks very much. That's Peter Cowley, Thank you. the Naked Scientist, tech correspondent and a Cambridge-based angel investor. Hi, Katie. How are you? I'm pretty snug, to be honest. <laughs> Quite cosy in here. The Naked Neuroscience podcast explores the workings of the brain and the nervous system in our bodies and beyond. It does not mean that you need to be sophisticated on an instrument. You can just hack on the piano. Wow, so I can legitimately tell my friends to shut up because <laughs> I've just passed my driving test. You have my blessing, yeah. 
Do you want to know who you are? Can we actually understand how we think? From lifting the lid on consciousness to remembering how to forget, join me, Katie Haler, each month as we make connections with scientists and spark up conversations on the latest neuroscience news. Listen and download for free at nakedscientists.com forward slash neuroscience or subscribe to Naked Neuroscience wherever you get your podcasts. Still to come, a pioneer of tomorrow's medicines, plus... But also locked in the ice are tiny bubbles of air, and these bubbles of air are the actual atmosphere of the past. How you can use ice to find ancient air. Before that, though, the story of how our early human ancestors originated in Africa and then colonised the Earth's surface is an evolving one. Sorry. And now scientists have added a new piece to that puzzle, as Adam has been finding out. When we think of northeastern Siberia, the most northeastern part of Russia, we think of a cold place where humans couldn't live. Plenty of people do live there, though, and while archaeological records go back 30,000 years, the genetics of the people who live there can't be traced back past about 10,000 years. Published in Nature, new work took DNA from milk teeth found in the region and uncovered evidence of a previously unknown group of humans called the Yana people. These people would predate the ancestors of Native Americans into Siberia and fill in a huge gap in the story of human migration. I spoke to S.K. Villerslev from the University of Cambridge about what got him interested in a story like this in the first place. Well, I've always been interested in the peopling of northeastern Siberia because when I was young, in my late teens and early 20s, I spent time as an explorer and also a trapper in northeastern Siberia. So that was before I became a scientist. But I was always wondering back then, why do we have all these people speaking different languages, having different lifestyles, and what are their relationship to Native Americans, which are just on the other side of the Bering Strait? What did he find out then? We basically have uncovered the population history of northeastern Siberia. And uh, there's been a lot of mystery connected to that story because uh, the archaeological record goes back more than 30,000 years for this area. While if you look at contemporary people and their genetics, it suggests that the history is no older than about 10,000 years. So by sequencing ancient skeleton remains, we have found out that there has been at least three migration waves of people into northeastern Siberia, and the earliest one dating back to 31,000 years. This is from two tiny milk teeth found at a site called the Yana site, close to the Yana River. And these people are a people that we didn't know before. It's a very old people that diversify approximately at the same time when Europeans and Asians are developing as uh, distinct groups. So there is actually kind of a third branch leading up to these uh, Yana people, but that are now extinct. These Yana people help puzzle out the story of modern Siberians and also of Native Americans. So Native Americans, many people thought that the ancestors of Native Americans must have been the first people in Siberia, but they're not. They're actually the second migration coming up there, and they are mixing up and replacing these Yana people. And then there's a third migration happening within the last 10,000 years, and this is the one giving rise to most Siberian people today. But getting DNA out of 30,000-year-old milk teeth can't be easy. How did they manage it? Well, that was also a challenge because uh, there was normally we use the root of the tooth and the crown, you know, we we basically, we don't believe there's much DNA in it. So we are keeping that and returning it to the museums and so forth. But in this case, there was almost no root material left on these tiny, tiny milk teeth. So we asked permission to basically polarize the crown. And we got that permission, and there was beautiful DNA preserved in in the crown of these teeth. And uh, from there, we reconstructed a very high-quality genomes. The climate of that part of the world isn't exactly the most inviting. How did these people adapt to live there? See, that is the interesting part, I think, because we always think of northeastern Siberia as one of the most hostile environments, right? I mean, it's one of the coldest areas on Earth. Temperatures go down to below minus 60 degrees Celsius. 
And, uh, you know, it's just not a place where we expected humans would like to be. And therefore, the general view has also been that the population history of northeastern Siberia has been very simple, right? I mean, it's not like many migrations or many different people wanted to go up there. But we can see this is definitely wrong. I mean, it's just as, you can say, dynamic as is, uh, you know, the prehistory of Europe, for example. And it's probably because... One thing in the equation we forget about when we think about northeastern Siberia today is that back in the Ice Age times, this was an area for a diverse fauna of big mammals. There was mammoth, woolly mammoth, rhinoceros, horses, bison, etc. And what we can see is that the Yana people up there 31,000 years ago were living as big game hunters. They were mainly living from woolly mammoth and woolly rhinoceros. So it's probably been a very productive place. And even though it's cold and windy, and, uh, well, uh, you're probably freezing your butt off up there, well, at least there was a lot of food. (laughs) (laughs) That was S.K. Velerslev speaking to me about his paper published in the journal Nature. I have to say, I do love S.K.'s sense of humour. Oh, he's quite a character. Yeah, he is certainly a character. Now, when the pharmaceutical industry was in its infancy, researchers would start with the disease, then they look for a drug that could make a difference to that disease. Well, that's largely all changed, as the industry has been able to now unpick the mechanisms of diseases right down to the genes that are causing them, and now they're building treatments that target precisely those pathways or systems that have gone wrong. Often, this involves crafting complex drugs, which are called biologics, that are often themselves made by living systems. Now, a good example of this being antibodies. One of the pioneers in this sector is biochemist Jane Osborne. She's from the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca. And she's just learned that her efforts over the last two decades doing this, which have actually led to the successful launch of a number of drugs that are changing lives all over the world, have been recognised by the award of an OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours. So we've invited Jane onto the programme to tell us a little bit about her field. Jane, a very warm welcome. Lovely to have you with us. Thank you, Chris. And first of all, these, these targeted treatments... How does this actually work? Well, maybe if I start by explaining what an antibody is. Antibodies are proteins that are produced by cells in your blood, plasma cells, um, and they are the body's defence mechanism. So they're the way that the body protects itself against pathogens, bacteria, viruses, generally referred to as antigens. And the reason that antibodies are so good at this is your body actually makes lots and lots of different versions of these proteins with different shapes. And those shapes can very precisely recognise the complementary shapes on the pathogens, on the antigens, and the antibody is able to neutralise those pathogens. And they do it selectively, so they're going to go for the bad guys and they're not going to touch the good guys. That's right, yes. So they, they, they have a way of recognising what's foreign and what is what is your, your normal um, repertoire of antigens. Occasionally you do have issues with that with autoimmune diseases, but in general that's very, very effective. And how are you seeking to utilise our knowledge of how these antibodies work and do that in order to cure disease? Well, the great thing, as you said at the beginning, is the very specific nature of these binding interactions means that you can target very precisely mechanisms that that are disrupted in human disease. And the reason antibodies are so good at that is because you can target a target on a cancer cell, say, or a a protein that's upregulated in the blood that maybe is causing inflammation. So you can specifically target those bad guys, if you like, and you you don't target um, anything that you wouldn't want to. So you don't get off-target effects, which sometimes you can get with the the sort of chemical-derived drugs. You're saying then one would make an antibody that would that would go after a specific target. Absolutely. But that means you've got to do that and make or make the body do that. It doesn't already do that. So how does one go yeah. about that? So we've developed quite a range of different techniques to do that, starting actually back in 1975, really, with the invention of monoclonal antibodies, which is a way of making large quantities of a single antibody of a single shape, which was actually developed here in Cambridge by Caesar Milstein. Caesar Milstein and George Kohler, yeah. Um, so that was the sort of first step. Um, and the first um, mouse antibodies were used to treat transplant rejection back in the early 80s. Um, now, you don't really want to use a mouse antibody to treat a human because it's a foreign protein. So your immune system would, would recognise this is not supposed to be in my body and you, you'd then have your own immune system attacking the very thing that you were trying to make to help you. 
Absolutely. So the holy grail of um, what we've been trying to do and many of our colleagues in the industry have been trying to do is develop fully human antibodies that won't be recognised as foreign by your body. And you can do that um, by using... um, You can actually use mice and knock out their own antibody genes and put human genes in there. Um, Or you can use a technique called phage display, which is a way of putting antibody genes on the surface of a virus and then using the virus to select antibodies that bind your drug target, your your disease target that you want to um, interact with. In essence, then, you know what the target is you want to go for. You've got to persuade an immune cell to start making the right antibody you're after. How do you then bulk that up? How do you, once you've got an antibody that you know is going to work, how do you make enormous amounts of it so you've got enough to treat a person? If you use the the phage display system, you can isolate the genes for the antibody that you want to make. And once you've done that, then you can put those genes into a stable cell system and you can make large amounts of it in fermenters. Um, So that's actually a, a, a relatively simple thing to do now. It's taken... It's taken 20 years to develop those uh, those techniques, but we can make large amounts outside the body and then inject them into the patient. You move the gene that makes the antibody into some kind of cell that you then grow in enormous quantities in culture. Yeah. And then you just sieve off the antibodies. That's correct, yeah. Even so, I mean, that sounds like enormous amounts of work because this industry has been frustrated by the fact that this is very hard to do and it does end up therefore costing a lot of money doesn't it so as the world's population continues to increase there are 7.5 billion people on earth now and that they all want a slice of the action and access to these wonderful treatments Mm -hmm. can we afford it well i mean drug affordability is a real challenge but what we're doing is working on ways that we can make the processes more efficient we can certainly make a lot more antibody in stable formats than we could when i started in the industry 25 years ago and I think the key thing is really making sure that we're using antibodies wisely for the right patients. So we've got a lot more sophisticated in our understanding of how you choose which patients will have the best and the most effective responses to our antibodies. Jane Osborne, OBE, thank you very much indeed for joining us and explaining about how your work has really changed the world in a lot of ways over the last couple of decades. Thank you, Jane, very much indeed. The Naked Scientists podcast is produced in association with Spitfire. Cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. You're listening to Naked Scientists with Chris Smith and Adam Murphy. And this week, things are going to get really, really cool because we're continuing our month of science at the extremes with a look at all things chilly, from science in Antarctica to how animals cope with the cold. Speaking of which, humans have been living in cold parts of the world for tens of thousands of years. But how did we adapt to life at these extremes? And what kind of challenges do you need to keep in mind if you want to thrive? Moreover, how did the early explorers to the pole survive? To find out, I took a trip to the Scott Polar Museum at the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge to meet Charlotte Connolly to learn about life at the extremes. In general, the further north and south you go from the equator, the colder it gets with both the North and South Poles covered in ice. You wouldn't think people would want to live there, but they do, and they have done for a very long time. People have been living in the Arctic for thousands of years. We're much more recent visitors to the Antarctic. But people who live in the Arctic and have lived in the Arctic for a long time have been reliant on typically animal materials, so furs and those kinds of things, to make sure that they can keep themselves warm. But they've also had to make sure that they eat enough fat, making sure their nutrition is right in order to have enough energy to live their lives. When people go off to Antarctica, if they're doing research with us, we know that if they're going to be out in the field, they need something like 6,000 calories a day. Four or five times as much energy is required just to kind of survive and live life in a a normal way if you're in a very cold area. Uh, There are a few other things to consider. So making sure that you keep warm is one of them, but keeping dry is another one. Some of the clothing that you'll see if you wander around the Polar Museum looks surprisingly thin. And that's because if you get too warm, if you get so warm that you sweat, then your sweat will chill you off more than if you are just wearing something thin. And when it comes to fur, some work better than others. One of the furs that was used by indigenous people, particularly across Scandinavia, but elsewhere as well, and then was adopted in the 20th and the 19th century by European explorers was reindeer fur. Now, reindeer fur is made up of lots of fibres that are hollow, so 
hollow things trap a bit of air in them, and that means they're really good insulators. So good, in fact, that when reindeer lay down in the snow or if snow falls on them, it doesn't melt because they're that well insulated. When Westerners came to start exploring these areas, aiming to be the first to reach the poles, what did they adopt to make the journey? We are stood in front of a sleeping bag. It's the sleeping bag that was used by Captain Oates, who was one of the people famously who lost his life on the expedition with Captain Scott. But the reason I'm pointing out to you is because it's made of reindeer fur. And that use of reindeer fur comes directly from people living in the Arctic who've lived there for thousands of years who know that reindeer fur is an incredibly good insulator. So it's an example of how in the 20th century people were still using those kind of technologies that they borrowed from people who live in the Arctic in order to keep themselves warm and safe when travelling in the polar regions. And what kind of foods would you have to bring for something like this? So in the museum, we've got various tins of things. We've got some stuff which is delightful called pemmican. Uh, That's kind of ground up meat and fat, which is very densely calorific and does exactly what you need, which is give you lots of energy. Unfortunately, it's not very interesting food to eat. So uh, the folks who are in the Antarctic with Captain Scott would boil a tub of water They'd put some pemmican in and then they'd add something, whether it was mustard powder or chocolate powder, really anything, just to give it a bit of flavour. We mentioned Scott's journey earlier. His trip to the Poles ended in tragedy. Captain Oates, who owned the reindeer sleeping bag, famously sacrificed himself, leaving the tent saying, I am just going outside, I may be some time, never to return. What went wrong with Scott's expedition? So Captain Scott went all the way to the South Pole, along with four companions. I always say it's one of those trips where if one of the things that went wrong had gone wrong, they'd have been fine. If two of the things that had gone wrong had gone wrong, they probably would have been fine. But there was an awful lot of little things, and some of them quite big things, that went wrong that all together conspired to make it a disaster for those people concerned. They were unlucky with the weather. Someone had got an old injury that opened up. They didn't have a good concept of what caused scurvy. They used a different type of technology to almonds and say. There were lots and lots of little things that all together added up to make it a problem. And unfortunately for those five people, they didn't make it back. What did Amundsen do differently that helped him? So Scott and Amundsen had totally different ambitions in getting to the South Pole. Amundsen was about getting there, planting a flag, getting back. Scott also was about getting there, planting a flag and getting back. But along the way, he was really interested in doing science. So actually, on the way back from the South Pole, they stopped to collect geological specimens, for example, at a point when they didn't realise how much they were endangering themselves. And so they just had different ambitions. And for Amundsen, it was absolutely a race. So he set about finding out what was the quickest way to get there. Whereas for Scott, it was a much bigger type of project. So they were just approaching it in really very different ways. And where Scott had lots of bad luck, Amundsen was taking an untried, untested, unmapped route. There was an element of luck there that there was actually a route through for him. Charlotte Connolly there filling me in on some very cool history. Very interesting, that. But it's not just humans that have had to adapt to life at very low temperatures. Other animals do that too, of course. And evolution has endowed them with an array of mechanisms that will enable them to cope and indeed even to flourish at very low temperatures. Lloyd Peck studies these adaptations at the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge. So, Lloyd, provocative question, what's the lowest then, the lowest temperature an animal can go to and survive? There are some animals that can be put into liquid nitrogen and they go solid. They don't freeze, they vitrify, they go like glass. And these are nematode worms and tardigrades. And you can take them down to below minus 90, they vitrify, you warm them up, they become liquid again and they function absolutely normally. That's not exactly living at low temperature, but it's surviving very, very low temperatures. How do they do it? They do it because they're very small and because their composition is one that allows them to go down to low temperatures very, very quickly. And that means they don't have the problem of ice crystals growing in them because they cool so fast that they just turn into the equivalent of a glass. So some bits of the body of a larger creature are going to be at a still relatively warm temperature when other bits are at a very low temperature and it's, and it's that that causes part of the problem then whereas if you're really small you lose heat really quickly everything gets cold all at once and you freeze solid. 
That's just about the right answer. Yeah, once you get above a certain size, then the cooling is at a rate whereby ice crystals can form. And those ice crystals are the real problem for organisms that are trying to live at low temperatures because the ice crystals break the cells, they break the tissues, and that damage inside the animal is what kills them off at the low temperatures. But there are some much bigger animals that do successfully freeze, aren't there? Things like frogs that that can tolerate being frozen absolutely rigid. Yeah, the the Canadian wood frogs are about the biggest. And in the wintertime, they freeze and you can take them into the laboratory. You can take them down to sub-zero temperatures. They freeze solid. They're just like an ice lolly. You can Don't taste as good, I bet. Well, I'd, I've never <laughs> licked one and tried to taste one. And I wouldn't advise anybody to try and do that. But their consistency is very much like a... So how like, do they do it then? How, how are they succeeding? Whereas if I put my strawberries in my freezer, they definitely don't re-emerge looking the way they went in. The way that the frogs do it is they specifically allow the water that is outside their cells to freeze. And they use a range of chemicals to stop the cells themselves freezing. So their cells stay completely intact. And they use chemicals to do that that are called cryoprotectants. And it's the freezing of the water outside the cells that makes them go solid. During the winter time. their metabolic rates drop really low. They use very little energy. Come the spring, they can defrost, but their cells have maintained a liquid environment throughout the whole of that. Other groups of animals, they use similar chemicals to these what are called cryoprotectants to stop the body freezing, and they survive at low temperatures by staying liquid all the time, and they use those chemicals and call them antifreezes. It's an interesting adaptation then. You either put yourself into a frozen state so you don't need to go and find food when conditions are just not very amenable to life in general with the ability to thaw yourself out afterwards or you do decide to stay liquid and you have to evolve to have some pretty clever strategies to do that. Can we use that science though? Because there, I can think of lots of examples where actually working out how these animals are doing this could turn into much better ways to freeze my strawberries or popsicles and things. Yeah, it's not so easy with things like strawberries, but we currently use the antifreeze from Antarctic fish to make our ice cream very smooth. And 10 or 15 years ago, there were real issues with making ice cream smoother because you wanted to control the size of the ice crystals and the technology we had then wasn't really very, very good at doing it. Is that what gives you a smooth ice cream then, smaller ice crystals? Yes, if you can keep the ice crystals small, the ice cream stays smooth. And what we do now is we get the ice crystals to a certain stage, we put in antifreeze that comes from our Antarctic fish that we culture in biotechnology, and that keeps those ice crystals at the size that we want, and it makes our ice cream very, very smooth compared to what it was. So there you go, there's a bit of science you can lick. Not, you wouldn't go near the frog, but <laughs> you'll, you'll eat an ice cream from an ice fish. That's right. And, <laughs> and you are, in fact, licking a bit of what's come from the technology based around an ice fish. That's right. But turning to Antarctica uh, again, which is somewhere you've spent a lot of time studying, you have sitting on the table in front of you something that looks pretty awesome. It's the size of a dinner plate. What's that? Well, actually, I've got two things on the table in front of me. One is about five millimetres across. And that one is one of the biggest sea spiders in the UK. But next to it is the one that you were talking about before, which is an Antarctic sea spider. I'm holding it up now. It's about a foot across, and it's not one of the biggest Antarctic sea spiders. The biggest ones that we get in the Antarctic are over two feet across, and they're at least 5,000 times heavier than the biggest sea spiders that we have in the UK. So why the difference then? This thing lives in very cold conditions. The other one lives in much warmer conditions, but is a lot smaller. Why? The difference is that as the temperature goes down, the metabolic rates of animals that are cold-blooded and are the same temperature as their environment go down. The temperature slows down their chemical reactions in their bodies. It slows down their metabolic rates. So in Antarctica, the metabolic rates of the animals living there are 20 to 30 times slower than animals in the tropics in the sea. There's also more oxygen in the water. There's roughly twice as much oxygen in the water in the Antarctic as there is in the tropics because it's more soluble at low temperatures. But those animals don't scuttle around a lot slower, despite having a lower metabolism, do they? They do. So do they? their activity Because I've rate, seen them moving. They don't move very, very slowly. Absolutely. Though. But if you compare them with a similar-sized animal in temperate zones, they're moving around three to four times slower than the similar animals. And that's in the just t- energy... That's a whole range of things, but it's the slowed physiology. It's the energy available. And that more oxygen and that slower use of the oxygen means they can get up to 5,000 times bigger on a weight basis.
Amazing. Thank you, Lloyd, very much for introducing them to us. It's incredible how animals can adapt when you want them to, can't they? That's Lloyd Peck. He's from the British Antarctic Survey. Still to come, just how cold can things get? We're chatting absolute zero. Heading in the opposite direction, though, climate change is considered to be one of the most serious threats facing us in the coming decades. So understanding why things are changing and how they've changed in the past is critically important. Travelling to the extreme cold and carrying out science in places that would freeze your fingernails off has its benefits, as I learned when I took a trip out to the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge to speak with Robert Mulvaney. Sometimes it doesn't matter if it's cold, even extremely cold, there's still science to be done. And there's lots of science being done in Antarctica. A lot of it has to do with ice cores, cylinders of ice taken out of the Antarctic ground. But to learn exactly what these tubes of ice are for, I spoke to Robert Mulvaney from the British Antarctic Survey, who has spent 25 seasons in Antarctica. I'm um, a glaciologist, and in particular I drill ice cores. And what I'm looking at is the climate and the atmosphere evolution over many thousands of years. So if we drill into the ice, we're drilling further back in time. So in the polar regions, you essentially get very little snow melting at the surface. As the snow falls, it just builds up year on year and eventually compresses to the point where it's, it's, the, th- the layers are really, really thin near the bed. But the ice might be two to three, maybe even four kilometres thick in places. If I go and sit with a camp on the surface and then set up a drill rig and drill down into the ice, I'm drilling further and further back into the past. Now, the ice remembers something about the climate. What we do is we drill these cores of ice, we bring them back to the lab here, and we measure things in the ice that tell us about the climate. But also locked in the ice are tiny bubbles of air, and these bubbles of air are the actual atmosphere of the past. It's the only place on Earth that still has an archive of past atmosphere. So as we drill deeper into the ice, we are able to recover the climate record from the ice itself, and then a record of the atmosphere from the bubbles trapped in the ice. To learn exactly how they keep the ice and what they do with it, we donned our jackets and wandered into the freezer. As it rings up an alarm. Oh, that is noticeably colder. (laughs) So I've just brought you into the cold laboratory here at Bass. We keep this room at about minus 25, and this is where we, we process the ice. So what we take is the column of ice that we've collected in Antarctica, and we cut it into the sections that we're going to use for, for analysis. So what we've got here, it's got a, an arrow on it to say which way up it is. It's just a column of ice. And the, every column of ice looks exactly the same, so we have to be able to identify it when we get back here. It's got the top at this end. So is that the newest ice at the top? Exactly. That's the, the bit nearest the surface is the youngest ice. The bit nearest the bottom is the oldest ice. We know at this site the, the ice at the bottom is likely to be something like 140,000 years old. So if you imagine we're in a warm period at the moment, if you go back to 140,000 years, you're in the ice age before last. So this is, this is ice age two. <laughs> so at the bottom of this core, the ice will be 140,000 years old or thereabouts. Back in the comfort of a nice warm office, waiting for my genes to come back to a normal temperature, I asked about the human effects on the climate. If we look at the greenhouse gases, what we see is through all of the cold periods, so all of the glacial periods, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 190 parts per million or thereabouts. If we go into a warm period, the number is about 270 parts per million. You get all the way up to about the 1770s, and suddenly it starts to rise. It starts to rise and continues to rise until you get to the level we see today in the atmosphere, which is about 410. And round about the 1770s was when the steam engine was invented. And almost as soon as the steam engine was invented, the Industrial Revolution kicked off. We started burning more and more fossil fuels, and almost instantly the atmosphere responded and carbon dioxide began to rise. The level of 410 we see today We can't see anything like it in the last 800,000 years. Now, I remember reading somewhere that you can see traces of lead in the ice from when we used to drive cars. Is that true? Yes, that's true. So almost anything that's emitted into the atmosphere in terms of pollution, if it remains in the atmosphere long enough to to be taken or carried by wind and circulation to the polar regions and deposited in snow, then there's a chance that we can measure it. It's very difficult to measure. If you imagine the amount of lead we're measuring is something like a grain of salt in an Olympic swimming pool. That's the sort of concentration we, we were trying to measure. 
what we were able to show is that the lead in the atmosphere had been rising again since the well since since the point where where cars started to use leaded petrol. Now there was a fairly low level of lead. We pursued lead in petrol, and the lead began to rise quite quickly. Now up until that point. I think the oil industries has always claimed that most of the lead you see in the atmosphere came from natural sources. It came from things like volcanoes. But when we showed them, when we showed them what the lead looks like in the polar regions, where you get this very low, low level and then a rise just at the point that lead was put into petrol, they said, "Okay, we we believe it. We understand. Lead was taken out of petrol, and now the lead is coming back down to the levels that we saw." Before it was ever introduced into petrol, so in a sense the atmosphere has cleaned itself up. There's much the much lower levels of lead in the atmosphere than we would have seen in the 70s, and it's back down to almost its background level. It took ages before I felt fully warm after that. My jeans were crunchy walking out of that freezer. It's it's an awesome sight though, isn't it? When you see those cores, because what what are they about six inches across? The the ones they've got, or even bigger? Yeah, just ten centimeters, not much. They more would, than they sort of fit down a drain pipe. Wouldn't yeah, they? easily. But, yeah, but they're big, long sections. And you think, I'm staring at, you know, in some cases, they showed me some stuff which is nearly a million years back. Yeah, it's, it's, this has pre-industrial air in it. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm very lucky to have seen that. Thank you for that report, Adam. Now, when it comes to cold, not even the Antarctic can outcompete the right physics lab. And to explain why, Nigel Cooper's with us. He's from the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, where he works on super cold stuff. So, Nigel, how cold can we go? Okay, well, to think about that, first it's helpful to understand what we mean by temperature. So temperature, to a physicist, is a measure of the thermal energy in a material due to all of the random jostling of its components. So if we have a gas of atoms in a box, that is largely carried by the kinetic energy, the motion and velocity of the of the particles. And so as we cool it down, that kinetic energy is removed and the uh, atoms move slower and slower. And what we understand from the laws of thermodynamics is, is that there's a limit where, in, at least in principle, where we can remove all of this thermal energy and the system has just reached its lowest energy state. And this is a, a state that we refer to as absolute zero. Well, I was going to say, if I took a, based on your analogy and, and you're pointing out that particles are, are moving around jostling, and when I stick a thermometer in a cup of tea, the hot water molecules are hitting the molecules in the thermometer and giving them energy, which is why the thermometer registers the temperature. So if I took my thermometer out of my tea and took it into space, because there's no molecules to hit it, what would it say then? Well, it's actually out in space. There is still some energy around, which is the microwave background radiation left over from the Big Bang, which after the expansion of the universe has cooled down to about two degrees above absolute zero. So we, we understand that there, there'll be radiation hitting the thermometer and that radiation will give it a temperature of two degrees. Now, whether your thermometer actually <laughs> registers uh, two degrees above absolute zero is another question, but in principle, there is some temperature there. And how do we know that there is this theoretical minimum which coincides with what we're calling absolute zero and what what value of temperature is that we know about the existence of this uh, this limit through the uh, the consistency of the laws of thermodynamics the many tests that have been done and the temperature itself has been established to be minus 273 degrees celsius so that's uh, extraordinarily cold of course and this is why from the perspective of a physicist we typically want to work with an absolute temperature scale where we start with zero at this absolute zero and then count upwards so the um, freezing point of water, zero degrees in the Celsius scale, is plus 270 degrees of Kelvin, this absolute temperature scale, and room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. So outer space is about 100 times colder than uh, room temperature. But from the low temperature physics that can be done now, there are different uh, techniques that you can use to cool down to much lower temperatures. So if you take a fridge that's working off liquid helium, then you can reduce the temperature to about one thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. So that's a thousand times colder than outer space. Or if you uh, are willing to work with dilute atomic gases, then the techniques that have been developed over the last 20 or 30 years allow you to cool that system down to about one billionth of a degree above absolute zero. Why not absolute zero itself? Is there no way of getting all the energy out? Why can't we actually get there? There is a a theorem established from thermodynamics in the 19th century by Kelvin and others uh, who worked on it then, that if you have a a refrigerator, uh, there's an efficiency of the refrigerator, uh, which depends on the ratio of the two temperatures on this absolute temperature scale. And in fact, that efficiency tells you how much heat can you pump out by a certain amount of work that you perform on the refrigerating cycle. And uh, that efficiency goes to zero as the cold side of the fridge goes to zero. So as you as so you, you try get and approach, close but never get there, you never quite. 
get there. Um, when you get very, very close, do you begin to get some insights into what might happen were you to get there? Do, do things behave in a bizarre way? Because I would be thinking that if you've got particles and we know that, that everything's made of atoms, they say never believe an atom because it makes up everything. But if you get to absolute zero, would everything just stop moving then? Well, no, the laws of quantum mechanics kick in. And in fact, they kicked in at a much higher temperature. So some of these, uh, depending on the gas or the system that you're looking at, as you cool it down, and the particles move more and more slowly, then we understand from quantum mechanics that the wave-like nature of that particle starts to become more important. The, the wavelength of a particle increases as you make it more slow. Uh, and so there's a point that one reaches for a, a gas at a certain density at which the quantum wavelength of each individual atom stretches across to its neighbour. And then there's a completely new form of behaviour that comes in where the gas behaves in a way that's completely unrelated to what we're familiar with at room temperature, and you get a certain collective quantum phenomena appearing, such as superconductivity or Bose-Einstein condensation, certain collective phenomena that appear uh, that are completely unfamiliar for, at room temperature. Could one think of it as though everything sort of locks together then and you get everything behaving as one? So instead of it just being one atom that bumps into another atom here and there, you end up with everything behaving as one at the same time because the, those wavelengths are all locked together. That's right. So it, depending on on, on the particular phase. So in a Bose-Einstein condensate, you can think there of a situation where all of the atoms are behaving in, a, in an identical manner. In other situations where there are stronger interactions, uh, you have everything locks together, but it can form some sort of collective fluid where the particles are dancing around each other in some very complex way. They can't quite come to rest because quantum mechanics prevents them from actually stopping completely, but the, the collective zero temperature state that you would have is some many particle collective state which uh, has, shows uh, interesting long distance behaviour. But, but Nigel, why should, why should I care? Why does this matter, this incredibly low temperature? The systems that, that are being developed have the potential to have some very dramatic applications. So at present, uh, they're being developed in a number of different directions. Uh, one of them is to form ultra-powerful quantum computers, which exploit the uh, laws of quantum mechanics, potentially to solve problems uh, that classical computers uh, could never solve. There's also the potential to use sensors formed from atomic clocks and other uh, quantum devices to make extremely uh, sensitive detectors. For example, there's a proposal to use such things to map out the gravitational potential of the Earth, working out, therefore, what is the mass distribution underneath the Earth without having to dig in to see what's there. And there are also potential uh, applications in using these uh, very sensitive sensors to detect particles that are predicted in uh, high-energy physics, to look for dark matter, and to uh, test other fundamental aspects of high-energy physics. Nigel, thank you very much for introducing us to your world and the science of the super cold. That's Nigel Cooper. He is from the Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. And thanks also to Lloyd Peck, who also took part in this part of the programme. Now, this is the part of the show where we usually tackle your questions for Question of the Week. But as it's Extremes Month, we're bringing you an extreme record of the week. This week, Heather Jameson has been looking into some really cool buildings. Humans have been using frozen water as a building material for centuries. The Inuit mastered the technique of building igloos using the most abundant material they had available, snow. The igloo was a means for hunters to survive brutal winters in a vast area spanning more than 3,500 miles, including eastern Siberia, Greenland, Alaska and parts of Canada, which can reach chilling temperatures of minus 58 degrees Celsius. Despite being made of frozen water, the temperature on the inside of an igloo can be 40 degrees Celsius higher than the outside when warmed by body heat alone. That's because pockets of air trapped in the snow provide really good insulation. Contrary to the way they are often depicted, an igloo is not so much a perfect dome shape, but more of a cone shape with a curved top, otherwise known as a paraboloid. When it comes to this shape, compression is key. The snow bricks are strong when you push down on them, but if you held a snow brick in both hands and pulled your hands apart, the brick would crumble. An igloo that is built correctly will support the weight of a person standing on the roof. Traditional Inuit igloos have an average internal diameter of 3.5 metres, and the largest ever built had an internal diameter of over 9 metres. But the largest structure ever to have been built from ice is the Ice Hotel in Jukasjave, Sweden, the entire hotel is made of snow and ice blocks. Even the glasses in the bar are made of ice. 
This requires around a thousand tons of ice and a volume of about 30,000 cubic meters of snice. And no, that's not just a compliment you give someone if their igloo is particularly fetching. Snice is a cross between snow and ice. It is made from a carefully controlled combination of water and air. It reflects the sun's rays and protects the ice inside the hotel from melting, which is down to the fact that snice has a higher density than natural snow and therefore insulates better and melts slower. But ready your sunglasses for this snowy sight. Yucas Yave's high positioning on the globe means that it experiences almost 100 days of continuous daylight in the summer months. With so much sunlight, this traditionally meant that the whole of the hotel melted back into the river every year. But now the Ice Hotel is using this solar power to its advantage, and since 2017 the hotel has been open for business all year round. That's thanks to a large concrete shell that has been erected to house a part of the Ice Hotel. The concrete shell is cooled by refrigerators which run off the power generated by 600 square metres of solar panels which can capture 24 hours of sunlight throughout the summer months. So now guests can enjoy cocktails in the ice bar under the northern lights in the winter or the midnight sun in the summer. Either way, I'm sure they would say that it's pretty snice. And if there are any extreme records you think we should explore, then email chris at thenakedscientists.com, find us on Facebook, tweet at Naked Scientists, or post it on the forum, thenakedscientists.com slash forum. Meanwhile, quick appeal to you. If you like the programme and you'd like to put a review onto whatever podcasting platform that you listen to us via, we would love that because it tells other people what you think of the programme and it tells us what you think of the programme. Other request, don't forget we've got our balloon heading off into space to hear you scream. If you'd like to send in a scream to hear yourself scream in space, the best scream is going to win and gets to go into space. We need to hear your screams soon. So send them in to me, chris at thenakedscientist.com. You just have to record yourself hollering, basically, into any device that will record things in reasonable quality. Send them chris at thenakedscientist.com and we'll have a bit of fun hopefully playing some of them in the lead up to our balloon going up. And lastly, if you do like this programme and you do listen regularly and you're willing to support us, we are running a donation drive to safeguard the next year of programming here on The Naked Scientist. We need to get to £50,000. We've almost got halfway. We'd really like you to help us to get beyond the halfway point soon. You just go to nakedscientist.com slash donate if you can help us. It would be truly, truly wonderful if you could do that. That, I'm afraid to say, though, is it for this week. Do join us at the same time next week when we're going to be turning extremely curious. It's a QA and a show all about the extremes. If you have any questions for that, it's chris at thenakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the EPSRC and Rolls-Royce. I'm Chris Smith. Thanks for listening, and until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.